what I like to think about is like almost a kind of a decade of um, planning efforts. And let me let me start by saying Houston gets a bad rap a lot of times for um, not being a city that does a whole lot of planning. And I am here to share with you and to tell you that we do a lot of planning, including with Houston Tomorrow and other agencies and advocacy groups. Um, we have spent a lot of time and energy in the past several years planning. And um, what we're doing today is we're really going back through these plans and implementing. So I'm gonna, uh, my primary topic today is on, um, it's not my, you're right, David, it's not advancing. Oh, there we go. No, my screen is not advancing. Um, David, you were absolutely right. Oh, there we go. Got it. Am I on the next slide now? Yes. Okay. Okay. So what I'm here today to talk with you about is livable places. And I want to just kind of explain that we've, we've done a, you know, many of you have been part of a variety of planning efforts that have gone on in the city of Houston for the past several years. Plan Houston was a big one, the city's first general plan. And we were very pleased when council adopted it as, um, as Houston's plan moving forward. But I think everybody understood that it was kind of a 20,000 foot look and see um, what we, what generally what we thought the strategies for Houston moving forward should be. Since then, um, Marissa Ajo, who's the city chief resilience officer, has created resilient the Houston's resilient Houston strategy, and that is a much more detailed, um, very action oriented plan that gives um, really very clear instructions on how to help Houston become more resilient. And then add to that the climate action plan, the communities, the complete communities plans that we've been working on with neighbors, the vision zero action plan that David's gonna talk about in a few moments. And we are blessed with a great variety of plans that um, have all been embraced by the public, embraced by city council and um, need action. So what, I've, what our team started looking at was how do we start doing what we've got control over to achieve these goals, the, the plans that are identified, the goals that are identified in these plans. And we went through each of these plans that I just showed and started picking out things that the planning departments got that was in our sphere of influence. What are some of the things that we can achieve that come out of these plans um, by changing or adjusting the, the regulations, the standards, the work that we do here in the planning department. Many of you um, were part of the Vision Zero, I'm sorry, the um, Walkable Places and Transit-Oriented Development efforts. And um, we were, you know, we're very grateful and we think that uh, we completed that last year and it completed an option for property owners to designate their block or blocks as a walkable place and benefit from a different set of standards that give them more buildable area, but also create places that encourage walkability and maybe more importantly, sitability. And we've really seen some good results from that plan so far. Um, working through it also included TOD pieces and established, you know, a better setback and a pedestrian realm for um, standards for properties, trans, uh, proximity to tra transit stations. And so we moved, th this is a result of the city moving really for the first time from a one size fits all type of um, standards to one that is really starting to be case sensitive and context sensitive. And we're pleased with the work and where it's starting to, where we're starting to see some results. We've seen a number of um, new and redevelopment projects going on in the three designated walkable places, as well as inside um, along the TOD streets that were designated. And so um, that is a good first step in the right direction, but is it enough? And we decided very early on that it was not enough and that the next thing we needed to do was go beyond a walkable place to a more livable place. Right. And so livable places is, what are talking um, about? Right, is our next step in creating standards that are going to, that are, in, that encourage infill development and residential construction that supports the multimodality and increased density that we all understand Houston needs. 
we are, um, if we're going to maximize the billions of dollars that have been invested in our Metropolitan Transit Association, if we're going to really become a vision zero city, if we're going to make the most out of our property and get the best benefit in terms of property taxes and benefit to property owners, then we need to become a more dense city and one that relies on multiple modes of transportation. And so that's what livable places is all about. Um, it is an action committee. We are uh, not planning, we are implementing. I keep doing this backwards. We are implementing. And so the livable places action committee is all about implementing the goals the actions that are called for in those plans in order to get us more opportunities for walkability and affordability and equity. And that's a real key factor in, in a lot of what we're doing. Um, for example, we've got, um, you know, right now there's a 27 unit per acre limit on single family residential structures. Is, is that right? It's 27 the right number? Should there be a limit? Should it be higher? Is it, how do we right size that there's no limit on the number of apartment complex, uh, apartment units per acre? So how do we right size that number? Right now, a single family unit can have a garage apartment behind it that is no larger than 900 square feet. Is 900 square feet the right number or is 1200 square feet? If we wanna bring families into the city of Houston, maybe what we wanna do is increase the garage apartment size so that families can live in them. Um, it increases the net worth for the property owner. It increases the, it reduces, you know, it broadens the variety of, of housing styles and types and price points that are available to Houstonians. So let's look at how we can expand that. Um, we've got a number of things that right now focus on protecting single family residential lots. The buffering, some of the buffering ordinances that the committee is currently looking at are addressed at single family lots of 3,500 square feet or more. But are those the only properties that need to be protected from um, the, the loss of air and light if a high rise or um, garages are placed next to them? So, you know, let's look at how we can address it in a more equitable way of addressing the protection of residential properties in general, whether they're leased or owned, whether they're single family or townhome or whatever the type of development style is. Um, we're also looking at the, some of the parking standards associated with residential, such as um, does a driveway, does a parking, if you're building a series of smaller residential units, do they all have to have parking attached to them? Or could they have a parking lot that's, um, you know, kind of on the side of the, if it's a full block. We, right now, um, about six months ago, we had a, affordable housing project come through and it required a variance because what they wanted to do was build several single structures and wanted to put the parking lot over on the side where it was um, more beneficial for their type of development and they had to get a variance for that. Well, does that make sense? Um, so we're looking at all of these things and, and trying to identify ways that we can change the planning department's the codes that we manage so that we can encourage a broader variety of housing, a broader variety of price points, infill development, all of that. I will say right now that, and David may talk about this in a few moments, this is not a full-blown review of our off-street parking rules. We're gonna look at parking as it relates to residential development. I, I do recognize that we need to look at our off-street parking rules at some point in the very near future, and we need to um, right size those, but we simply don't have the staff capacity at this point to do that. And that this is focusing on, you know, parking as it relates to the residential developments in our neighborhoods. Um, so briefly, it's a committee of, of really diverse, I'm really proud of this committee. It's not only agency and um, uh, industry experts, it's, we've got planners on it, we've got advocates on it, we've got um, people who know, who are building affordable housing, people who are building market rate housing. We've got a really good variety of people on the committee. And so um, I think we're gonna end up with some very good decisions and recommendations going forward to council. It is, um, 
a year and a half long process. And what we are doing differently than what we did with walkable places is we are going to take the recommendations to city council periodically. We're not gonna wait until the very end and then take one big um, group of changes to council all at one time. As we work through a topic, work through an area that's you know discreet and of itself, we'll take that to council and have um, and have them start implement, have them approve it so we can actually start seeing some of these improvements right away so we don't have to wait till the very end. Um, we, are, we are already planning on taking to council. We've got a public comment period open for some very small technical amendments that we need that we needed to make right off the bat. But right now the committee is focusing on buffering and um, as soon as they come up with a recommendation on how we, how we can change the lighting, and um, the distance buffering for um, for mid-rise and high-rise and garage developments, then we'll take that to council instead of having to wait. The entire process is full of community engagement. We have a new online platform that um, is really um, good for engagement. I'm gonna talk about it in a moment, but it's Let's Talk Houston. And so we've constantly got survey questions up. It's a way to collect comments um, from the public in this time of virtual activity. And then once we get the go ahead to go back out to the public, we will be out in you know where the public is in a very safe manner, trying to make sure that we collect um, comments from everybody because we understand that virtual you know really is a narrower um, a narrower slice of Houston life than what we really want to hear from. Um, there are, um, so like I said, we're talking about buffering right now. The, um, the buffering ordinances, how we can make them more, how do we encourage development along transit-oriented develop uh, along transit-oriented streets and discourage them from inside the middle of residential neighborhoods? And if, um, if there is a blend, while we're increasing density, we're all gonna have to live a little bit more compactly with each other. How do we make sure that this more compact development doesn't really, isn't a detriment to neighborhoods? And um, everything we're working at, we've got a technical advisory committee of people who are actually, whether it's city of Houston folks that implement these, that you know work through the ordinances through permitting and that type of thing, or other parts of our community, we're making sure that everything we recommend is doable and um, can stand the test of time. Uh, there is one separate group that's kind of working independently from the full committee, and that is a conservation districts focus group. We recognize that there is a need for the protection of some level of historic and cultural um, neighborhoods in Houston the historic district program that we have is um, very um, intensive. It you know deals with everything from replacement of windows to what type and style a, a column on your French porch can be. And it takes a very high bar of public support in order to create one of those districts, making it something that may work in the Heights, but doesn't necessarily work in neighborhoods that are um, more rental occupancy as opposed to owner occupancy. So this committee is looking at ways we can have a, um, a new type of district that doesn't deal with the details that a historic district or the historic material um, in a historic district, but deals with the personality of a neighborhood or what I tend to say is the ethos of a neighborhood. How can we protect that ethos without um, actually having a historic district and all of the pieces that go along with that. So they're trying to um, create kind of a hybrid and the next meeting is today, tomorrow. Now I can't remember, um, I believe it's today. And then they'll probably come up with a recommendation sending to the Livable Places Action Committee next week. And um, so that'll be on our website and all the details associated with that. I, I will, before the time we end, I will get the exact login information on how to get to that meeting if you're interested. Um, so Let's Talk Houston is our online, I just lost my screen. How do I lose my screen? Um, is our online platform where we are collecting virtual comments. We 
frequently have surveys out there, questions out there. What do you feel about this? How do you, um, how do you think we ought to attack that? And we regularly check this. So I recommend that you go to letstalkhouston.org backslash livable places on a frequent basis and, and put your comments in on how um, you think some of these um, changes ought to be taking place. And um, if you're interested, Suvita Bondi, Jennifer Oslin, and Henson are the three people in our office who are really leading this charge. They are all accessible. You can call them directly. You could also call me and talk with me about it if you've got questions. But um, we are very excited about this. And, you know, I think that this combined with Vision, with Vision Zero, which David's going to talk about, and the more progressive council that we have had in the past year, I think we're on the right path in Houston, and I couldn't, couldn't be more excited about where we're going to go. So that is it for me. I'm happy to take questions, or if you want to wait till after David speaks, I can I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. And um, yeah, so that's it. Thank you, Margaret. If anybody has any questions, you can use the raise your hand feature or look up in the chat. Um, guys, am I um, having trouble sharing my, stop sharing my screen? Hmm. Resize the window. I think I can sort of stop you, so I'll try. <laughs> can you, yeah, can you take it away from me? <laughs> If you can take that power away from me, I would be thrilled. You want to, um, stop sharing the okay. All right, back to you. Um, well, I, I wonder if David could steal the screen sharing. It's working on it. <laughs> okay. It looks like Margaret. I think I'm done. Did I, did I give it back? Yeah, I think we're good now. It switched to David. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, we have a okay. question. Okay. Margaret, do you want to? There's a question from Kathy Lord. Um, Kathy, do you want to say your question or do you want me to read it? Uh, let me see if I can unmute you. Uh, here you. Or, oh, I can read it, and I, it's a very sad question. But I'm, but <laughs> so I don't have an answer. Anybody's going to like about that. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Uh, so there's two things going on with the with the River Oaks Theater. If I can just for a moment opine on that, um, there's the financial aspect of it, which, quite honestly, the city of Houston doesn't really have a between the lessee and the lessor on whether they can come to terms on the lease. Um, the building is a different matter. The building is um, a landmark. It is not a protected landmark. And so therefore it is not subject, it is, it is not subject to demolition prevention. So if the, the operation of the theater goes away and the property owner or wishes to demolish the building, they can do that. The only way um, that we can fully protect historic buildings in Houston is with property owner support, either through the creation of a historic district, which it is not in, or through independent protected landmark status. And property owners have chosen not to do that. So that's the, that's the, sad answer to the question. We're a city that chooses to let property owners um, do with their property as they as they choose. And um, that is, that's, that's what we are. So did that answer your question, <laughs> Kathy? Sadly, I, I knew that would probably be the answer, but I know in some towns, the city will buy a structure to save it because we have no other theaters that are of that, that kind left. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I see that happening in Houston. I have heard people interested in, um, I've heard 
people talk about taking over the theater operations itself in a way similar to the way the consortium came in and bought the Francis Bookstore many years ago. But that, again, is just the operation. And I don't think that um, that conversation actually included the theater continuing to operate at that location. So that's all I know. Sad. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, I wish they could build a giant building, but just on top of the theater, <laughs> you know, <laughs> leave the theater there. Um, we let's do maybe two more questions. Uh, Kevin Strickland, um, if you'd like to ask, I guess you're saying you have a question, but you didn't actually put the question, but about how Vision Zero actually can work with affordable housing projects. Um, you know, would, would you like me to clarify? It's sort of a geeky, very granular yeah. question. Okay, and if this is the right venue for it, I don't want to get us off track. Um, uh, the housing department has a very complicated score by which they evaluate the projects to put forward for the city. Uh, I believe it's flawed or missing some things. Part of what's missing is there's no evaluation of walkability, accessibility, vision zero. And I'm wondering if there's a way to get it incorporated into their scoring. So for example, their scoring assigns out of, I don't know, like let's say 57 points, one point for access to public transportation and one point for if the project's gonna recycle. So it, I think that tells you right away how discombobulated the process is. And so when these projects are slated to go into the dense urban areas, the Vision Zero, um, to me, it should be more, needs to be recognized by the city. So I'm, I'm wondering if there's a way to incorporate that into HCDD's scoring process. I've tried to flag this to them, but uh, without success. I'm not sure who that's for. So. Let me take a <laughs> Yeah, let me let me start with I can hand it off to David to talk about the vision zero aspect directly, but I will say that um, over the past few years we have really developed a much closer relationship with HCDD and the urban design principles that we espouse from the planning department are now being embedded into more conversations at HCDD than ever before. And the planning department is on um, a number of panels reviewing RF, reviewing the applications for housing and um, and that type of thing. So our goals of walkability, accessibility, equity, um, from an urban forum perspective, are now being um, embedded in the the metrics that they're using to choose projects. There's um, more so than they've ever been in the past. Um, I know that they have used some of these in the past, but I, but we're really, this relationship that we're building, we're on their team, we're, we're talking to them regularly. They get that building, um, that allowing a, an apartment building that um, has no access to the corner where the bus stop is because there's a fence around it that you know protects the, the residents, but doesn't give them access to the transit is, is the wrong way to go. And so those conversations, what you're suggesting is more and more part of the, the metrics these days. I heartily suggest you continue to can talk to them from whatever um, direction you can, but I'm, I will say that there has been some, a great deal of progress made. Thank you. Um, Jeff, you had a question. And uh, and then and then finish after that. We'll do the rest of the questions after that. Okay. So David Fields is the city's transportation planner, the first one the city's ever had, and uh, and that's obviously very exciting for those of us who've been kind of worrying about why we don't have transportation planning 
in the in the way that other cities do. So so he's been around now almost a year. Is that right? And and uh, and and have really interesting ideas that he expressed here when we did this about eight months ago. And so we're happy to have David Fields, the, the shiny new transportation planner of the city of Houston. Thanks, David. Uh, and thank you everybody for having me. I, I just do want to start with one correction and give out the right props. The city's had transportation planners for a while. Uh, we have had a team that works very, very hard way before me and was already setting great groundwork. Uh, I'm lucky enough to in, have inherited a great team. Uh, so I'll being the city's first chief transportation planner, there have been people looking after your roads and uh, your interest on transportation for a long time. And we want to make sure, uh, you know, we recognize that, that it is not me, but the vision that we're working on, which is what I really wanted to present today. So that, that's perfectly teed up. We're going to talk about more than just Vision Zero, but then maybe uh, we'll come back to that as a focus. Um, make sure I can. Here we go. Uh, so everything we do, we really like to start with why are we here? Why do we get up every morning and come to work for the city? It is really nuts and bolts. Mm -hmm. and it's very basic to us. We're here to make a safe system that is something everybody can rely on. And that means we have to have it multimodal. We have to have it a network that accommodates everybody throughout the entire city. And the result, if we do this right, is a safer place for everything we want to do. And when you think about what those, those things are and teeing off of what Margaret was talking about, that's living and working and playing, really resulting in economic opportunities and quality of life. So aside from a few geeky transportation people like myself and my team, few people ride the bus for the fun of riding the bus. They are traveling to do something to go to school, to go to work, to see people. That's what they care about, that it is safe and that they can do it in a reliable way. And it is these results that we are aiming for with our work. So the first up, really the foundation is our Vision Zero Action Plan. This was released at the end of last year. Uh, it was a year of intense data collection and analysis and a lot of public engagement to frame it in the right way. Uh, there were some questions in the chat about what is this? Very, very simply at the base format of this, it is that no loss of life on our roads is acceptable. These are completely within our control. This is not putting a man on the moon. This is not brain surgery. This is how we plan, design, construct, and operate our roads. So our commitment is to end traffic-related deaths and serious injuries on our roads by 2030. It is a heavy lift. Just so you all know, every year for the last few years, we've had over 200 fatalities and over a thousand serious injuries on our road. That's every single year. So when we talk about why we are doing this work, we look at those uh, numbers. In on the plan, we actually name people their first name and last initial. And we say, if we do our work right, we stop people from dying. And in a field like planning, it is very useful to every day remember your mission. The action plan consists of 50 actions and 13 of those are priorities. Those are the ones that if we get those right, it really creates a synergy for the rest. That includes redesigning 10 uh, locations every two years on our high injury network. I'll come back to that in a sec. Building 50 miles of sidewalk and 25 miles of high comfort bike facilities each year. Uh, our high injury network looked at all the crashes over the last five years and started to identify consistent patterns so that we could uh, fix things in a more strategic fashion. The data goes like this. S over uh, approximately 60% of our crashes happens on only 6% of our streets. So H Houston is a huge place but when we say, okay, well, we could try to fix everything or we can try to fix the places that are uh, impacting people's lives the most. So we say that high injury network, those are the places we need to focus on. And then we overlay that with socially vulnerable communities, including the mayor's complete communities and start to say, okay, these are the places that have had the least attention and possibly have the highest number of crashes. And those places are over half of the high injury network. So our to-do list is clear. 
fix the places that are causing the most uh, negative results. The next step is our Houston bike plan. Um, and just so you know, you all know Houston's a very big place. Um, we talk about over uh, today having over almost 400 miles of high comfort bike facilities and that already puts a lot of cities to shame. Most cities are talking about if they hit 100, they've done great. We are very, very lucky to have excellent partners uh, like in the bayous uh, where we have been able to have networks of bike facilities that they may have started as recreation, but they are full use today. But our plan is to extend that to uh, over 1500 miles of high comfort bike facilities. This is what we're aiming for to make Houston a gold level biking city. And while we're doing those things, we're doing some other things like coordinating uh, the city's response to the North Houston Highway Improvement Project, leading the major thoroughfare and freeway plan, supporting our complete communities, uh, supporting the walkable places and TOD ordinances that Margaret talked about. We piloted some slow streets this year, one in uh, the Eastwood neighborhood, and hopefully uh, you've all been down to more space uh, down on Main Street where uh, we have allowed, uh, we've closed off the street in ports of it and restaurants and bars are setting up shop in the street itself. So to activate the space and use our right of way as productively as possible. As you heard earlier, we're starting that review of off street parking requirements. Uh, and that is not just looking at what the requirement is but how we frame that completely for access. And we also do connectivity studies. We just completed uh, the Montrose Midtown connectivity study you might have seen in the news uh, and which immediately uh, identified six projects. The first has already been funded. Uh, so that is everything we're doing and how we're taking all these pieces to eventually end up with that place that is walkable, that is safe and reliable for everybody. And with that, I'll take some questions. So uh, I'm, because we don't know how this is all going to work, I'm going to let Jay manage the questions, which we have over here in the chat department. And there are some comments. But I have one question here that someone sent me earlier from Marin Thomas. So let me ask that, because it's not in the chat pile. And Marin says, how do you get youth, particularly tweens and teens, engaged and involved in Vision Zero? especially in educating them about traffic safety and how to advocate in their own communities for better practices. David, you want to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so engagement is one of the key aspects of Vision Zero. Um, what we know is projects that are locally owned and initiatives that people embrace go a lot further than us, uh, you know, downtown and offices putting out reports. Um, when we were developing the plan, we wanted to do much more engagement, but it was COVID. Uh, we were a little bit limited. Uh, we were out in public, but we also had very long sessions. And what we've heard was not enough people know about this work that we're doing. Uh, so we're actually working uh, with uh, different groups to start to get that work locally. We are um, uh, teeing up what's called a hackathon to help communicate that message, uh, but in ways that aren't so plannery, aren't so jargony, um, and ways that uh, the public will really embrace. One of the aspects we're doing, um, so when we finished the plan, we immediately rolled into implementation and we have an implementation group uh, we just met yesterday. It is not just the planners and engineers and city people and agencies. We have a member of the public whose sole role is to help us translate our work into what the public will own you know, are these terms people understand? Are we getting that message out? We are literally just starting this process, but we think this is a very different approach as opposed to, you know, just kind of going and doing the work, but providing a way for uh, the community to be involved. Um, I don't have a very specific answer because honestly, I'm an older white guy uh, and younger people tend not to listen to me all that much, but this is a way to get out of me and into those people, how they can own Vision Zero. Okay, uh, <clears throat> maybe there's another question on Vision Zero. So I'll ask that to David next uh, from Jimmy Dunn. 
what specifically has the city done to reduce the 200 plus deaths on our streets annually? Uh, so even before we finish Vision Zero, you all might have seen uh, the list of top intersections uh, for improvement. Um, those uh, came out, I'm going to get my math wrong, but you know, call it a year and a half ago, maybe two at this point. And we've been going down that list. Those were kind of the precursors to the high injury network, the places uh, that um, you know, are the most uh, dangerous by different metrics. And we've been working on specifically fixing those and we're well on the, on the way to that. Um, we're also doing some things a little more subtle that the public might not recognize, but are going to have a huge impact long-term. And I hate to be wonkish here, but uh, a lot of traffic analysis has historically looked at what we call level of service for cars which is how many cars can make it through a traffic signal on one cycle. And if they can't, what do we have to do to fix it so they can? Well, what that means is, are we accommodating pedestrians? What about bicycles? What about a bus full of 30 people? Should that have the same amount of weight as one car with one person? So what we have said, one of the actions in Vision Zero is instead of looking at vehicle level of service, we're shifting to what we call multimodal level of service. So if safety for people is our highest priority, maybe we move a few, a few cars fewer through a signal at one time, but we do it safely. And all mitigation is focused on that as the priority. So projects that come in the future are going to inherently be safer when we support them. Great. Um, we have a question from Gary Schatz um, about the hearing on uh, HB 442 yesterday, the Safe Neighborhood Streets Bill. Um, but he brought up the quote from Terry Hall, who's in the Texans turf, the anti-toll road people. Um, but th it really presents a sentiment that, you know, anything that slows down Texas traffic even more just doesn't make sense to us. We've got to facilitate the smoother flow of traffic. And so what do you, what can the city do um, to help people understand, you know, speed and 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 safety and human lives and things like that. You know how do how do we change this view? Uh, there are a lot of pieces to it, and I could go for a while on it, but I'll, I'll try to hit the big points. One, if we are talking about the economic vitality of our city, there is no doubt that dead people don't help. Let's be very honest about it. They don't pay taxes. They cost us a lot. You know, sending ambulances, sending fire trucks. We are hurting ourselves if we believe faster speeds are the only way to economic success. What is success for economics is getting people to those stores, to those jobs, and home again safely every single day. So if we can have a safer system, we actually do ourselves a much bigger service. It's why hospitals are inv investing in safe routes to school projects, because that they know if fewer kids are uh, obese, if they have fewer health issues, they come into their uh, emergency rooms less often, and that they can be serving the ones with the higher needs. The next piece of it is the question of why is this belief that the only way we travel is by driving? It's a common perception, but it's a misperception in our city. We know a lot of people travel in a lot of different ways, and very few people do only one thing every single day. Sure, many people drive to work, but do they walk to the park? Do their kids bike to school? It is start to say we are a multimodal city and we're going to start to accommodate it because every person who isn't driving is a little more space on our roads for those who are. And if we can reduce those volumes, you might actually be able to get to work a little bit faster. Or if we get 30 people in a bus, how much more space do we have for something else? So getting out of this binary mindset that cars going fast is the only economic solution is key to a su successful city. Great. Um, maybe I'll jump to John Sloan's question. Um, he's saying that Northeast Houston is lacking sidewalks and traffic control and walkable places. How does Northeast Houston get included in these adding these benefits? Um, so all of our uh, transportation support is really meant as networks for everybody. Uh, again, it is a huge city and we are not consistent all the way around. Um, it is going to take us a while to get everywhere, but the mayor has been very supportive of networks that move people by all modes. Um, so uh, we are, you know, 
putting in things like the walkable places ordinance, the KOD ordinance that encourage and uh, provide opportunities for it to come in. And then the other pieces we uh, need to hear from communities that are you know, really want to jump to the top of the list because it's a big city um, and there's a lot we need to do. You know, look on the bike network. Are there projects that you wanna, you wanna advocate for? Let us know that, let your council people know that. Um, are there places on the high injury network? That is going to be our top, you know, top priorities for projects. Um, so the idea is to be equitable. We want this everywhere. And we have to really focus on resources on where we can do the most uh, in the soonest amount of time. Great. Uh, maybe I'll- I want to add to that. Can I add just yeah. one thing to that about, um, so Hogan Street in the near north side, both the, along the transit line and along Hogan Street, Hogan Street's one of our pilot walkable places. And so the development patterns that will take place over the next several years along Hogan east of uh, 45 will create a more walkable, sitable environment based on the rules that are in place there. And then also the, the TOD changes that were made in the walkable places TOD rules um, along the transit will, will again require better pedestrian realms, wider sidewalks, um, less interference between automobile and pedestrians. So, you know, fewer parking lots in front of buildings, closer buildings that are closer to the, um, the, the, the pedestrian realm itself, closer to the street. Um, so all of those pieces of the TOD ordinance that we've put in place are, um, are going to transform that area as development takes place. And I, I will note that Bill Baldwin's on this call also, and Bill was the chairman of Walkable Places. He might have something he wants to add to this also. But, you know, nothing's, nothing not, you know, Vision Zero has got a very short term goal and we applaud that and we will, and we will accomplish that. Um, and walkable places in TOD is probably a little bit longer term goal in that we, we probably won't see dramatic changes overnight, but there, there's development going, going on all across our town. And so as development, as redevelopment takes place, these, these new standards are gonna be implemented. Yeah, I, I just added to the chat, but if any area is interested in walkable places, the staff is available to explain it thoroughly, you know, shepherd them through the process. Are there any number of us on the planning commission that could speak to homeowners associations, business groups, property owners to explain the benefits of it? I mean, these first three initial pilot programs were really just to spearhead the conversation so that where there is interest, if that's in the near north side or the west side or the south Anywhere. side, we're here to help. So let us help you get what you want uh, by, by utilizing the staff and the tools that we have to, to help you start the process. That's really great. And just to be, you, know, you sort of just said it, but that any part of the city of Houston could adopt walkable places and that the sort of neighborhoods can work with you and the the planning department to do that. Yeah, anyone can start the conversation. They may not, everywhere may not qualify. You know, Kingwood Boulevard, where there's no residential areas, may not qualify the same way as Lower Westheimer would. But I mean, anyone can start the conversation so that the staff could evaluate the probability and then the buy in that you have of the property owner. So I, I think every area is up for conversation. Right, Margaret? Mm -hmm. I mean, not everywhere is going to qualify, but every area should be evaluated. Well, as long as the property owners agree, the, the bar for quote qualifying is, is very low. It just requires property owner support. Yeah. Terrific. Um, I was hoping to throw in my sort of working off of um, John Sloan's comment that in terms of sidewalks, and I think one of the things that the city of Austin has that I don't, not sure if any other Texas city has that I think is really useful is the sidewalk map, which has um, all the missing sidewalks and broken sidewalks and then a, a signs of priority. So there's very high priority and high priority and lower priority. And that system includes equity checks and, and underserved communities, but also mm -hmm. low income people who are more likely to walk and things like that. And I, I think um, that's a very useful tool. And then my other comment is that, uh, you know, that's part of a sidewalk master plan, which the city of Houston doesn't have. And massive bond spending to facilitate sidewalk spending. And so 
Absolutely. I think the city of Houston needs a billion dollar safe multimodal bond on the ballot in, in November, but the, the planning department needs that kind of map to basically, you know, get the sidewalks to the people who need it most, that kind of stuff. So it, am I wrong? And it, it does, the, do you guys have that kind of stuff that I don't know about? <laughs> Or what no, do we don't have that kind of stuff that you don't know about. <laughs> um, and um, you're and you're not wrong that we that Austin's leading the way in Texas in that regard. We we really do think that there's a great deal of, that we can learn from Austin. David might want to amplify this in a moment, but I also want to say, you know, we are, and I'm going to make David blush for a moment. We are part of the reason that I am so positive about where we're going as a city, um, both with the progressive city council that we've got. The planning commission who every two weeks pushes us to be more um, to be more equitable and more walkable and and really pushes us in the direction of um, of a better urban form we have two people who have recently joined the city staff who are light years who are who are taking us into the next generation and that's David as the chief transportation planner and while he's right we've had transportation planning for decades I um, I don't want to discount anybody who came before him. David really has brought um, an amazing variety of ideas and urgency to the table. But in addition to that, Veronica Davis, who's now the deputy director in public works, um, he and da he and Veronica are you know kind of joined at the hip. They are both absolutely simpatico that our roadways are built for all kinds of users and not just cars and that um, our land uses, our development patterns all need to address getting Houstonians from point A to point B safely in whatever way they choose or need to go. And so for the first time in my history with the city of Houston, between David and Veronica, we've got transportation leaders inside the, inside the system who are pushing us to be better. Okay, great. Um, I was sort of going to go back to some of the questions we missed. Um, there was a question about, Margaret, what you talked about, um, which they put as the new conservation program, but are there specific- oh, conservation districts? Yeah, and are mm -hmm. there specific neighborhoods currently being considered for that? Yeah, there are, um, only because these are the neighborhoods that have come forth and really wanted to work closely with us. So conservation districts, as I said, is kind of a hybrid between the very um, highly regulated, very specific historic districts where we've got lots of historic material where buildings are 120 years old and the siding on them is as old as that and the windows can be as old as that. And so the intent is to save not only the the appearance from this, well, it focuses on what you can see from the street, but it's the intent is to not only save the, you know, the overall appearance of the street as you drive down it or walk down it, but also the windows and the materials and the, um, the elements that make up those structures. We have lots of neighborhoods who ha that have that same historic feel to them, but don't have the um, historic material in as much um, in as much as some of the other neighborhoods that we have. And so those are the neighborhoods that have come to us and they said, look, we don't qualify for historic districts. We don't have, you know, not all of our homes are pristine Victorians or anything like that, but we want to preserve the, the, um, the personality of this neighborhood. And we see a lot of it changing. And so how do we as property owners protect what we have owned for years from incompatible development coming in. And those are the neighborhoods that have really brought conservation districts to the fore. That includes places like Independence Heights. It includes places like Freedmanstown, where, um, you know, Freedmanstown is a national register district that 15 years ago had more than 600 um, structures that were listed, you know, that, that, that combined to make up the national register district. Today, there's about 50. So, you know, the historic, Material may not be there, but the ambiance still is. The, um, the personality of that neighborhood is, and they want to protect that. So Independence Heights, Freedmanstown are the first two we're really talking to because they've come to us asking for this resource. But there are any number of other neighborhoods around town. I mean, you look into the East End and while 
Um, Eastwood is, an, is, again, it's a national register district that offers no protection. And there, so maybe what they want is, um, is a protection against, um, you know, massing or scale. They want to preserve the scale of the neighborhood. Um, there are other neighborhoods, you know, that that it could, might be appropriate um, to, you know, maybe what maybe what the conservation district does is it preserves the idea that this this is a business corridor, and so you've got, um, you know, I'm, we've not had any conversations with folks on maybe it's Alabama, maybe it's um, emancipation, maybe it's any of these neighborhoods that have historic business corridors, you know, that are historic business corridors that want to protect that and want new construction to come in, but they want it to, to honor the existing. And so those are some of the neighborhoods that this, that this type of a conservation district would work with. So can I interject something here, which sure. is, uh, this is David, um, that we, we sort of have to be, see our neighborhoods a little differently, I think, to ever get this done right. A neighborhood, like I live in the Montrose, there are many places where I live on a single family street and the street behind me is all duplexes and the street behind that is West Time. And so to say this neighborhood has a feel or a size or a scale isn't right. It's that parts of the neighborhood are very dense and some are not. And so what we wanna protect and improve is the two kinds of things in the neighborhood so that we get to, a center in the neighborhood where there's a store and there's a Brazil and there's a this and a that, maybe the buildings someday are 20 stories high and so forth. But two blocks away on Herald Street, there's still houses. And then that's been really hard for us all to see that what this looks like is, is a neighborhood always has to contain a center. It always contains a place where people gather or where people shop or whatever. And so you're talking about kind of a circle and, and that's the conservation sort of thing that, that people have a hard time. I know that if you came into this neighborhood here into my, my district and said, okay, every neighborhood has to have 30% more people because we're gonna grow like that or whatever the number is today. It wouldn't take very long for them to decide, okay, that's gonna go on West Timer. <laughs> Let's not put that on Herald Street they'd get it figured out pretty quickly that, okay, if, you're gonna, if you have to have density, let's put it where it already is and where people actually want it and need it, but let's leave the other piece alone. So thank you for all you're doing on this. This is mind boggling to me that it's even a topic uh, <laughs> because it's been the other way for quite a long time. So thank you, that's my comment. Yeah, and so what we're trying to figure out with livable places and what, we're, what we will be doing is we will be looking at the rules and changing the rules, adjusting them so that we can encourage the increasing, um, so that we can encourage a, a, an increasing variety of housing opportunities for Houstonians. And if that means we need to increase, you know, if you've got the space in your garage, in, in your backyard, why can't you put in a 1200 square foot um, garage apartment so that you could lease it to a family of three or maybe even four. I mean, how many of us grew up in 1200 square foot houses? I had six people in my family in one um, as a kid. So, you know, so that you could lease it to, you know, a, a more than just a single person, more than just a couple. And what that does is that brings families back into the neighborhood, that brings families back into the local schools, that also provides for the property owners some increase in wealth. So it, it's, why are we limiting it? Why, why can't we let it be what it needs, what, the, what the, the property owner needs it to be and what the city needs it? So those are, the, those are the questions we're struggling with and how big is too big? I don't know the answer to that. The committee may not know the answer to that today, but you know, we're gonna do enough research, we're gonna do enough engagement, we're gonna talk to enough people so that we'll have a number that we propose to the city. 27 units per acre is the maximum single family at the, you cannot build more than 27 single family units per acre in Houston, anywhere. But yet you can build as many apartment units as you want in that acre. You can- Or condos. Um, or condominiums. And, and so what, why 27 and why, you know, so maybe some neighborhoods 
needed to be, you know, and I get the word, I get what you say, David, about neighborhoods, but I'm use, I'm going to use that word generically. And it means maybe it's a couple blocks or maybe it's 50 blocks. I don't, I don't know. And I'm not really trying to make that distinction in this conversation, but there are maybe some places in Houston where, um, where we need and can really use 40 units per acre, you know, um, maybe we do a bunch of tiny houses on a few on a few blocks and in a neighborhood in an area that, um, you know, where that type of housing is really beneficial, it's next to the rail, it's next to, um, maybe it's next to some industry, maybe it's, you know, I, I don't know, but why 27? That's the answer. Um, a friend of mine's on the call, and I'm glad to see her name here, but she's they're working on a new project that Houston's never seen before, that um, it's a, ho- a co-housing opportunity that brings in just a different type of ownership status. And we very much want to see these different types of housing opportunities, because right now we're building one or two different types of houses and homes in the city. And I don't think that's right, but that's the way our rules are directing people. You subdivide a single family lot into either three or six or um, sometimes two lots and you build townhomes on it. That's fine, but is that all? Uh, We need to have different opportunities. And that's what Livable Places is looking at. How do we increase the diversity of the homes that we all have access to buying in Houston so that we, Maybe that doesn't, maybe what works for me doesn't work for you. Great. Do we want to do one last question? I think it's an interesting question about public transit uh, from Parish Patel. Um, that, you know, in, in the wake of COVID, there's a steep decline in public transit metro ridership. Um, so what, what can be done to improve perceptions and confidence that it's safe from a public health lens to, to get back on the bus? <laughs> I'm going to dive into this one if nobody minds. Um, I, I think as a profession, we've done ourselves a disservice by making everybody believe that commute trips are all trips, that everything we set up is about the, the trip in and the trip out. And what if I told you commute trips are only 20% of trips during the week? Well, that means we have built our systems around less than a quarter of what we actually need to focus on. <laughs> So during COVID, certainly a lot of transit ridership went away, the bulk of that being those commute trips. Um, but there have been many, many people, uh, essential workers who still have been going to their work, but also people who use transit for uh, shopping, to go to church, uh, to medical appointments. That has been pretty consistent the whole time. So the overall ridership, uh, really based on uh, you know further uh, point-to-point analysis, has gone down. But these other trips are still there, and I think the thing that is going to eventually uh, be the wake-up call for our profession uh, and for the transit industry is doubling down on the full-day trips, where it's not just you know 15-minute service just from 7:30 in the morning to 8:30 in the morning, but you know the right amount of service all day long, so people can use transit for all the trips they need to do. And that eventually is what is going to make the difference in our lives. Well, great. Thank you all very much. I wanted to uh, say, to to look back at something we uh, produced at the very early uh, Livable Houston meetings in 1999. There were 12 principles for development that about 30 groups came together and approved. And one of them was focus on safe, healthy, walkable neighborhoods. And when you used to say that to people, it was always, no matter who you talked to about it, it was, that can never happen in Houston. Mm-hmm. And many of those, some of those people were actually in the planning department. It is absolutely thrilling to see that that's history and that that, in fact, is now the core, seems to me, the sort of core of principles that are driving the, the development of the city forward. So, so, I mean, I am personally grateful to Margaret and David for, and all the people in the planning department and, of course, all, all the citizens who take part. In, and it's not fun. It's not easy to be a citizen in these processes. So I'm grateful to everybody who's working on this and grateful to all of you for your interest in this. And, uh, and thanks again to, to Margaret Wallace Brown and David Fields for all the work they're doing. Thank you, Jay, for your help here and keeping it from going into complete chaos.
we'll try to do this again soon and we'll let you know. And I, I have all the questions in the chat. We'll see if we can pull them out and send them off to Margaret and David and perhaps you get some answers uh, privately. I don't know, but thank you again. And thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Bye-bye. <laughs>